Good morning, my name is Tom Cottingham and I'm one of the founders of Flyover Media Group and we are the publishers of Flyover Future. And this morning we are fortunate to have Richard Hartnett who is a distinguished academic, um, a mentor, what, 20 PhD students, um, recognized for excellence in teaching, and is also, and we'll touch on this a little bit, um, I think kind of an entrepreneur in in the academic world. And at Flyover Future, we like to cover sort of the innovation of the innovation economies and the institutions and the cities that help those grow. And it looks like you're doing all kinds of different things at, uh, at UC. I don't know where you find the time and the energy, but um, <laughs> anyway, where I'd like to start is you have a PhD in political science from Johns Hopkins. Um, you've got two Fulbright appointments, I think. Um, and yet you're very involved in cybersecurity and policy issues around that. So I just kind of want to talk about your intellectual journey from political science to getting involved in specifically in cybersecurity, which is such a big issue and, and our readers are really interested in it as well. Well, thank you. Thanks for the welcome and uh, thanks for the opportunity to, to, to speak with uh, with you today and uh, and your uh, both listeners and uh, subscribers. Uh, so yeah, so that journey, uh, to be honest with you, we got to go back to early 1990s, 91, 92. Uh, and most of my work at that time was looking at uh, transitions uh, at the end of the Cold War, actually I hadn't ended just yet, uh, but looking at uh, the emergence of precision weaponry, actually. Uh, and there sure. were some discussions uh, among people that said, well, maybe, you know, our reliance on nuclear deterrence, maybe we could rely on precision conventional weapons, right, and get yeah. the same kind of deterrent uh, effect. And the work that I was doing as I was finishing up my degree at Johns Hopkins uh, said, no, that that doesn't hold, right? That you get a fundamentally different um, dynamic with regard to uh, deterrence when you deal with contestable costs. That's what conventional uh, conventional world is. Sorry to interrupt, but does tactical nuclear weapons fit into that category or not? Well, you know, so we we labeled the, you know, tactical, Tactical nuclear weapons. Remember that a tactical nuclear weapon uh, deployed uh, to meet uh, Soviet uh, tanks coming across the Folder Gap was about the size of the Hiroshima bomb. Right, right. Right. So these were not, not, these were not a trivial tiny, event. <laughs> not a trivial event, right? Um, so they were tactical in the sense of where they were deployed and where they would be used. They would be used on the battlefield, but these were sizable, uh, sure, you know, right. weaponry, right? Um, and so my work uh, suggests that these were incontestable costs, you know, that we got the metaphor right, that if you press the uh, button, the nuclear button, you get the result, right? Yeah. And uh, and so uh, the work that I was doing uh, as an outside academic uh, for Defense Department, uh, an agency came along and said, hey, you know, we got this thing called a, a browser. Um, what, do you, what do you think the security implications uh, of this thing is going to be? And could you apply your, you know, this modeling uh, of different uh, deterrence dynamics to that? DOD was behind the original structure infrastructure of the Internet, right? Yeah, right. So the connection between cyber and, and nukes uh, is um, that the ARPANET was uh, essentially a uh, Defense Department uh, attempt to figure out how you sustain a communication system uh, if you lost the centr- central, right, that's distributed, node, right, right, and uh, uh, and so the idea of a network, that's where it came from, right, uh, and so uh, yeah, so there's a connection to those pathways, uh, right, uh, but I uh, came along and did some analysis and said this just does not map up uh, that the uh, structural environment of this thing called, you know, that was not called cyberspace at the time, this idea of ubiquitous network computing, a network of networks emerging uh, through the internet, uh, that it had its own distinct uh, dynamics and logic. And so for the last 25 some odd years, Tom, well, uh, uh, it wasn't called cybersecurity back then. 
Um, I've been right. noodling, you know, this this notion of um, we have essentially a, a third strategic environment, right? We have an environment of of traditional warfare in which security rests on an interplay between offense and defense. And then you had in 1945, one plane, one bomb, one city. Right. And that changed everything because the question became, how do I secure when I can't defend? Right. Because one plane's going to get through. Right. Sure. And so we came up with this notion that uh, security rested in the minds of our opponent, not in our own hands anymore. That's what deterrence boils down to, right? I got to convince you not to attack me. I can't physically stop you from attacking me. Right. right? So then you get into game theory, right? <laughs> yeah, and entered, entered a lot of that type of uh, analysis. And so uh, just this Tuesday, uh, uh, released um, by Oxford University Press, uh, in my book with uh, co-authors uh, Michael Fisher-Keller and Emily Goldman uh, on cyber persistence theory. Uh, redefining national security in cyberspace. And this is the theory uh, behind um, the doctrinal changes that the US, um, US Cyber Command and, and, and the US government overall have been making over the last few years. Uh, and uh, I served as a scholar in residence um, at the um, at Cyber Command and National Security Agency and had the opportunity to help assist with uh, those uh, real-world uh, policy changes uh, and strategy changes, and this is the book that uh, that explains why uh, we actually have to make those changes. And it is uh, an argument, uh, Tom, that uh, applies uh, to uh, business as well as uh, government, because uh, everybody, you know, if you hear a CEO speech or a government uh, policy. Uh, official talk about cyberspace they'll it'll go it'll start off with something like cyberspace it's global and interconnected right we've all heard that right but that those two uh, conditions are fundamentally different than the terrestrial space which is all about segmentation sure right we segment behind borders behind oceans behind mountains right and this is how we've uh um, uh, organized international security and national security for millennia. But how do you do it when you're connected to everybody? Right. When you're connected to your uh, allies, your adversaries, your private sector, your public sector, uh, and is global. And so right. the idea here that we could take just as in 1945, when we couldn't uh, take the strategies that we used literally to win the war, win right. the Second World War and produce security, that those war fighting strategies no longer pertain with this new technological development called uh, the atomic and then nuclear uh, bomb we're in the same state. We don't have the same mushroom cloud moment, Tom, right? right? Where it's so obvious that we're fundamentally have to reorganize security differently. Uh, but that's, but that's in fact, the implications of global and interconnected. Sure. And change the security question. And, uh, and our argument in line with, uh, with where uh, US government uh, policy has gone is that uh, in cyberspace, you have to persist in the pursuit of uh, initiative. Um, that uh, this is an inherently vulnerable space. It wasn't built for security. It was built for access and efficiency, right? Right. And it's, it's tremendous at producing access and efficiency. Right. But if you want to uh, leverage that access for unauthorized things, um, it enables that as well. And so persistence, uh, what we call initiative persistence, means that whether you're a business or you're a government, you have to anticipate the exploitation of your network vulnerabilities before they're exploited. Right. right. Otherwise, so you're playing cleanup 
uh, on aisle nine every day. Yeah, and this is this is the arms race that is that is so tricky for everybody. Um, you know, you look at security issues. You've got state actors, you've got criminals, you've got vandals, right? Um, and we're worried about all of those things. And then you've got a gazillion nodes with employees at the end of them um, who are, you know, at a coffee shop and an unsecured network. Um, and we talk to business leaders, you know, every day, and this is top of mind, but it's almost so overwhelming that it's hard to figure out where to start you know, what are the essentials? And so out of those things, what, where would you focus? I mean, is it the state actors? Is it North Korea hacking Sony? You know, I mean, or is it criminals who are sending phishing uh, emails? Yeah. So I think down at the, at the unit level, it starts with what's your, what's your crown jewels, right? So if, uh, if you're a state, those are particular national level economic assets, sure. political assets. National security, assets. right. Right. Um, if you're a business, right, th this, this may be your core intellectual property, right? And so that the starting point, Tom, is, is efficiency and access are great. And, uh, and, we, and we, we have to um, uh, leverage the technology for those things, but we have to recognize, right, the, the, the potential for exploitation of vulnerability. And so I need to make assessments as a business uh, owner um, of a trade-off, right? Uh, do those crown jewels, if I lost those crown jewels tomorrow, if I lost that intellectual property, or if I lost that process, um, if I lost that data set, is that the end of my business? Is that right. setting me back six months in, in the competitive marketplace, right? How much can I absorb disruption or loss to those core things? And then I have to rethink and say, okay, maybe a little less efficiency and a little bit more security around those crown jewels. Does that mean that I have to impose the same security processes across my entire enterprise? No. Right. But I, but I have to start off with that level of identification. And the, the gold standards on, on this are, are businesses that understand where those key assets lie and then putting them in a uh, in a functional and technical space that makes them less exposed. Right, right. right. And so I've, I've dealt with, uh, with an industry um, that, uh, that um, deploys uh, what they call sneaker net. I don't know if you've ever used sneaker net. No. Uh, so sneaker net is that the analysis that's being done at the uh, data production level, I'll just, anonymize this right, right? Yeah. They're, they're producing the data over here and they need to get it over to the analytical shop they hand it on a device and a kid in the sneaker walks it across and gives it to the the analytical division right this is not going over even an internal intranet interesting right? so now that's an extreme that's, you know, an entity that says, hey, this literally is the crown jewel if we ever lost it, right? Right. And so they're, they're doing the work in segmented uh, uh, computer systems. That's, well, that's like that's, people keeping service, servers on-prem because they don't yeah. want to be in the cloud, right? Right. And so, you know, that's, a, that's an extreme, right? The more sophisticated level is making sure it's – uh, and, and this is sort of the newest techniques uh, that are paying some benefits, less about concern about who's getting in and making sure that what you don't want getting out doesn't get out. So the movement, the movement of you, you have control over the movement of your data within your networks, mm -hmm. right? So can you establish protocols uh, within your intranet? And then if it goes external where 
you know, big data packages are not going unless they're they pass through a uh, a checkpoint, right? Right, right. And you so you look at outgoing more than incoming. Yeah, uh, because you, you're worried about infiltration, right? Uh, well, it's a lot, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot less to focus on, right? Yeah, and so that's getting to your point. So while it can seem overwhelming, we can start to step back and strip back and say, look. It, we got to move away from this firewall, big castle defense modality and understand that we're in a persistent and engaged environment in which uh, vulnerabilities are going to be exploited. So I have to minimize that exploitation when it does occur. And this is the most critical thing. Can I anticipate it right, right. through my own processes? And this is where a government and public sector support of private sector, what I call alignment rather than partnership, because I think okay. it's more about aligning processes and expectations rather than uh, partnering. Partners have to have a shared interest, right? Right. And in most cases, Tom, uh, the profit-seeking entity in our economy has a different interest when it wakes up in the morning than the security seeking national security. Yeah, yeah. You got to right? look at incentives, right? Yeah. And that's okay. And, and so what we got to do is just align those interests, right? So that I can profit seek and I can security seek simultaneously. Right. That makes tons of sense. And I, I think it is really interesting that why focus on all the incoming vulnerabilities? I mean, there are a gazillion of them focus on securing the data that really matters. I think that's one of the issues we have in business. We have too much data yeah. and not enough information. And people have access to all kinds of data that they really never use, right? And just cutting that off. What do you think about some of the biometric technologies that are coming along? I mean, back we're back to the nodes now, but still, I mean, there are companies that, are, that can identify people through keystrokes. I mean, is that yeah. useful or is that just fighting that that Sisyphean, you know, task where you're never going to really get there? Yeah, no, I mean, I don't want to foreclose any any step towards security. Right. Uh, right. There, there are outcomes based on um, the trade offs and the cost is not just simply the cost of the product right, or the cost of the pro platform. But what is the cost to your people who have to be trained? Uh, mm -hmm. and the people who have to use these uh, these processes. Those, we have to stop thinking, in my own view, Tom, is we have to stop thinking about those straight up as bottom line costs and start to understand them as just simply part of doing effective business in the digital space. That's, so, see, and I think that's such an important point. And, I really think that a lot of leadership, I, I know just from the feedback we get all the time, is that a lot of the leadership in business really doesn't understand what you're saying, which is this is fundamental, right? This is yeah. part of the cost of a business. And if you're not funding it and assigning resources to get these things done, you're really vulnerable, but, but getting people to pay attention to that, you know, in the C-suite. Yeah. Is a it's, challenge. It's, it's both a challenge. I, I think it's a, it's a challenge that's been decreasing in my, in my experiences, Tom, over yeah, the last sure. few years. However, it, that doesn't, that awareness doesn't necessarily translate into a fundamental business practice. Right. And this is, you know, and, and part of this is the legacy of how we looked at IT. So it was born with a view on efficiency and access. Right. And and so to to understand that by leveraging that efficiency and access, it's actually put me in a vulnerable space. Mm -hmm. Most, uh, you know, uh, when I talk to state officials, for example, and we talk about economic development, you know, uh, small business economic development. You wouldn't have a strategy 
of marketing uh, a particular city uh, or a, a workforce. Say, hey, come and open up your business here. And as soon as you get you know going and and you actually have a, a you know value added um, intellectual property, you can expect um, to be uh, attacked and somebody stealing trying to steal all your stuff um, every day. And good luck with that, right? Yeah. You're on your own, right? Yeah. But that's what cyberspace is. So the terrestrial space, we came up with, you know, protocols on law enforcement where the state and the private sector uh, separate. And we're still trying to feel our way through, Tom, even though we're 30 some odd years into profit making right. in, in this space, what those core relationships are. And uh, I understand from a business standpoint, there's always been a, there's a general allergy to anything that that smacks of regulatory constraints or, or yeah, right. um, but but regulations are just rules of the road. Sure. And it's and and if we start to understand that we need some better rules of the ro road in terms of roles and responsibilities. So how does for example government get better at helping? private sector on cyber crime if we don't actually know uh, we don't know the data on the crime itself if we don't have reporting right that we do in all other areas of crime uh, how do we actually create good strategies and policies if we don't actually know the expanse of the problem well, and companies so, a lot of times don't want to disclose that they've been exactly. hacked or whatever, right? I mean, they're, they're, it's not just uh, acts of omission, it's acts of commission. Yeah, um, and, and this has evolved, you know, to have some, uh, and I know all the, I understand the explanations behind it, uh, but we have to step back and say, how did we get here? Is this actually where we want to be? Right. And, and uh, you know, my my own view is that we've got to start to shift ground so that we don't keep uh, business uh, as isolated in the security environment as it is. Uh, and, you know, as we as we know, you know, here, the economies in the Midwest, for example, in particular. You know, these are these are primarily small business owners um, mm -hmm. in which their IT staff, you and I may be double what their staff is on this call. Yeah. They've got yeah. one person doing email, marketing, web. Oh, and yeah, can you secure some stuff for us? Well, mm -hmm. and they may have a client or a customer who is doing business with the government, and therefore they need to meet those security requirements, yeah. right? Because they're yeah. down the food chain. This is a this is a huge issue. So let's segue for us for a minute. One of the things I love about your career is that first, you're very entrepreneurial. I don't know if you think of yourself that way, but you know, you've been involved in in some pretty innovative things and in, in starting some some really interesting organizations. And you also seem to be very practical, right? I mean, I love some of the stuff you're doing, and we'll talk about it a little bit. But let's talk a little bit about the University of Cincinnati. And I don't know even know if we've mentioned University of Cincinnati. If we haven't, my bad, because um, we could write about what UC is doing every week um, in Flyover Future. It's really incredible how that institution has embraced this innovation economy and is approaching it from so many different ways. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about cyber range and some of that at the end, because that, I think that's really where the rubber meets the road. But talk a little bit about the Center for uh, Cybersecurity and Policy. Yeah, so the Center for Cyber Strategy and Policy. Strategy uh, and Policy. It, yeah, it, it sits in our uh, new school of public and international affairs. So let me get a plug in for that. Um, sure. we, we've um, just uh, this uh, spring uh, transformed our uh, Department of Political Science that had been around for 104 years uh, into this uh, new school. And the School of Public and International Affairs has basically a mission, uh, a much more intentional mission to align the research that we're doing, uh, Tom, uh, to public impact. Uh, and uh, and 
given the the government uh, angle to a lot of our our work, uh, the policy input, uh, impact, right? But we don't want to be talking to ourselves. Uh, you know, it, we need to be speak. Our research speaks to uh, the institutions and the people that we are uh, are researching. And sure. so, uh, cyber is a carve out at the Center for Cyber Strategy and Policy um, here at UC. Uh, has been around now for uh, two, formally around uh, for two years, uh, and it's anchored on understanding the concept of cyber persistence and the strategy, uh, the DOD uh, uh, approach, operational approach of persistent engagement and defend forward. And so we, uh, on our site, uh, we've got uh, some uh, graphic videos that we're trying to to use for people that are not familiar with these concepts and try to introduce right. them in a little different way. Um, so you um, uh, encourage folks to, to, to take a look at um, at uc.edu and uh, search for SPIA. And that's how yeah, we we'll, go. Put, we'll put links in the show notes for that. That's That'd great. be great. Um, but that, uh, that center uh, now has expanded uh, significantly. And uh, we're going to be moving uh, into uh, talking about UC's innovation. We're going to be moving into a new building here in a month. That's uh, exciting. It's, it's on the corner of um, Martin Luther King and uh, I-71. It's a new interchange there. And this is uh, what we call our digital futures complex. And uh, what's exciting about this, Tom, is that uh, our, uh, what we call the Secured Cyber Lab, this research arm uh, of the uh, Ohio Cyber Range Institute that we'll talk about in a little bit. But the research that we're doing in cyber is an intersection of information technology, computer engineering, computer science, and strategic studies. So those like myself that look at this from uh, a strategy standpoint, from a legal and organizational standpoint, along with the computing sciences. And our argument, Tom, uh, is that one of the reasons why we're so cyber insecure is that there's been not enough conversation between the technical and the strategic and the behavior. Well, yeah, I mean, oh, man. And so we're going to we jump our, So this new digital futures building is moving all of our leading researchers in this area into uh, the same physical space. So I walk out of my lab and we now have a lab in uh that's covering all of our sensing uh research so this is down on the technical side to you know uh, cameras lenses all that type of stuff but on the uh on the wearable uh side of right. things for, for for both health and surveillance down to the digital uh interface side so it, it's some of the work that you were talking about earlier about being able to track I go another hundred uh, feet down the hundred yards down the uh, hallway, and I've got our uh, artificial intelligence fuzzy logic uh, group, and then another uh, few uh, feet down the uh, down the aisle, and it's our biometric uh, data analytics group. And so on one floor, and there's going to be five floors. So, right. but I'll just talk to you about the one we're. We're, we're breaking down the walls of traditional university yeah. uh, environments, right? We, we basically have been structured as feudal medieval institutions since right. medieval times. Um, and so fascinatingly, and, I, and then what I'm excited about uh, is that in this digital age, we're going back to physical proximity mattering. Because if I don't, you know, one thing that, uh, you know, I'm sure most of your audience will resonate with Zoom's been great, you know, digital interfaces have been wonderful. But the the thing that's been missing during the pandemic and what highlighted for me was that hallway conversation. Yep. That conversation that occurs after the meeting and you say, hey, you know, you got a few minutes um, or, you know, it, it happens an hour later where I walk back into your office and say, Tom, now I get what you were saying. Right. right? Yeah, nobody that's ever does where, that. That's where, innovation, <laughs> that's where innovation happens, right? Well, it happens in those sidebars. And so we're going to create a, a whole bu building ecosystem of sidebars. And so, you know, my bias uh, coming out of the secure lab 
is you can't have a digital future that's not secure. So I'm going to be banging on the door of all my other research friends now saying, we got to bake this in. So how do you think about sensing and surveillance? Yeah, IOG guys. <laughs> from the beginning, right? right? How do we do this from an AI standpoint? How do we do this from a transport or transportation? Uh, we've got a whole drone division uh, in, in the building. We're, we're, we're literally flying drones uh, in the building. So, uh, but I, I, I'm serious about, you know, this, this issue is that we've been plating on security to, in a, mm -hmm. to technical advancement over the last 25, 30 years. And the coin of the realm now, Tom, is that we, we've got to bake security in so we still have efficiency and access, but we've done, we're doing it in a much more secure way. Yeah, and, it's, and it's fundamental. And that's what we're going to focus our attention on in this new digital futures building. I mean, that just sounds so cool. And what you're doing, it's really interesting. Um, we had a panel a few weeks ago um, with leaders who are building innovation districts in their cities. And it's this idea of this interdisciplinary mashup, right? Mm -hmm. um, and physical proximity and the importance of that right now. Yeah. People still will have remote workers, et cetera, et cetera. But having a place where people can go, a locus, um, and a multidisciplinary locus, what is exactly what you're building on a micro level. And and I think that really is the future. I mean, you and I are the same circa, and IT leadership that's in place today, that's our generation, um, and, and I'm sure you know this, but 90% of them came out of coding, right? right. They were... Yeah tech and they were tech. DIY, right? Yeah. Like I'll come in on Sunday and reboot the servers, right? Um, and that silo, right? Um, you know, it served us well for, for, you know, a period of time, but that's being broken down. And what's fascinating to me is um, we get people like um, Debbie Reynolds or Carlota Sage who are now tech leaders but like you didn't come up that way, right? Came up through social sciences or something else and, and realized how important this was and taught themselves mm -hmm. and, you know, really became experts. And so it's people coming into technology from other disciplines that I think is really going to make, you know, this too interesting. Right. And. Yeah, no, I think that's that's exactly right. Uh, you know, we all we, we all have uh, some path dependency, uh, right. right, to the way we think uh, and we approach. Um, but I don't need to become expert in everything to bring value add. Uh, we just need to be able to start to uh, bring um, these interdisciplinary kinds of structures together. The good news on this time is that the, the digital futures complex is, has a second building in which uh, the city of Cincinnati, Uptown Consortium, uh, the chamber and other partners with UC are all in on this complex. So it is this innovation district, the Cincinnati yeah. Innovation District. Uh, the, the state of Ohio um, is investing in this as well. Uh, and uh, it's, it's gonna be transformational uh, because the value of the university uh, gets, um, if you will, uh, is less impactful if we sit up on a hill, you know? And, uh, yep. and so, uh, the whole idea behind the innovation district is, uh, to get a connection, right, between, uh, what industry and the private sector needs as well as government and what our researchers can do. Uh, so one of the uh, one area, I'll just uh, throw a quick uh, thing out. Uh, we're doing this down at the integrated circuit level. So uh, right. we, we have a, an issue uh, right now with regard to inter integrated circuits that 90%, about 90 percent of them are produced overseas. The U.S. Uh, consumes 50 percent of those. And the best estimates that I've seen about 50% of that market is right now counterfeit, right? Really? Yeah, it's, it's enormous, right? 
Uh, and so our ability to, uh, to protect IP, uh, to make sure that uh, these counterfeits don't have manipulated um, circuits, you know, uh, is a real, real challenge. So uh, we have um, uh, a center that uh, my center on strategy and policy is working with computer engineers. It's our Center for uh, Hardware and Embedded uh, Secure Systems Trust, CHEST. Uh, and uh, we're working uh, with industry partners in a very in, uh, different collaboration. It's, it's called the a universe, Industry University um, Research Collaborative Center. And they pool their resources and say, uh, here's a list of things that we need uh, researchers to do. And uh, they choose the research projects. Right. Um, and so we respond to the industry or government need. And then through this pooling of resources, they fund the uh, research teams. Uh, the National Science Foundation is supporting us here at UC to do this. And the, the great uh, aspect of this, Tom, is that 90 cents on the dollar that industry puts in uh, goes to direct research costs. Um, that's a good data point. <laughs> and, and, that's, uh, and then everybody gets uh, to share the IP, right? So you are... Um, so that becomes are, part of the public domain or it becomes just available to the people in the consortium? People in the consortium. Right, right, right. And so, Fascinating. So if you become a member of of um, of chest, uh, then uh, your your increment uh, of uh, of investment, uh, and it's pretty small to get in, uh, is multiplied by, you know, uh, everybody else that's in. So we've got sixteen uh, projects being funded right now, uh, wow. and uh, with universities across the country. So we run the center here. And then we reach out if we don't have the research expertise, we get the research expertise uh, through other national partners. Um, and so we're really excited about, you know, those types of, of practical um, uh, impertinent uh, responses to, uh, to, to industry and, uh, and government needs. And that's UC's culture, University of Cincinnati, you know, invented co-op. Uh, yeah. uh, education and uh, so it's kind of in our lifeblood to try to be uh, I think you used the word practical uh, earlier um, so we are trying to be practical uh, and also be um, uh, responsive uh, to uh, to the needs of entrepreneurs uh, well, who are driving where we're going and that and that takes us to uh, to the last thing I wanted to talk about which is the cyber range right so yeah. talk about getting practical and what I love about that, um, from what I know, and, and I'd love you to tell us more, is talent development is the issue, right? I mean, when you talk about innovation, in the first 30 seconds, you're going to be talking about talent retention, talent yeah. attraction, all that. And what you guys are doing, I mean, so many different programs for building a workforce um, it, it appears to me to be at all ends of the spectrum um, is really fascinating and, and is, I mean, it is, you know, it's the keystone of everything that's going to happen in Cincinnati for the next generation, right? And in flyover country, I think it's fantastic. So talk a little bit about cyber range. Yeah, no, thanks for, uh, for giving us that, uh, that opportunity. So the Ohio Cyber Range Institute uh, sits here at the uh, University of Cincinnati. We host it on behalf of the state of Ohio. So this is a, uh, a platform uh, being supported by the state. In fact, I had the honor uh, last week of uh, testifying up at the General Assembly to our uh, Technology and Innovation Committee uh, about the progress that we've been making on this range. Um, to, for, for your uh, listeners, I mean, it is a, a virtual space in which we can enclave uh, bad things, right? Because bad things uh, happen against security. So we want to, how do we train the next workforce to secure uh, this, this absolute, you know, what, what is vital for the economy 
uh, here in Ohio, in the Midwest, uh, and nationally. If they don't actually hands-on get to work it. Right. But uh, but you don't want to be releasing malware, you know, uh, <laughs> openly in, 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 into the uh, into the internet. So what the range gives us is from the most rudimentary learning. So we're reaching down into uh, right now our K through 12 is focused on high school. Right. Programming. Uh, we're supporting over a couple of hundred uh, high school classes around the state that can take modules from our OCRI library that we've developed with age specific and level specific uh, details. And again, from an efficiency standpoint, this is available to any educators uh, in Ohio uh, that um, that become a member, doesn't cost you anything, uh, right. just do our training on the on the range. Uh, we're, we've got over 350 uh, uh, university level, uh, community college and university level uh, modules uh, that are being used in our first two years. So uh, I I like to tell the story, Tom, if you don't uh, mind, we were up with uh, Lieutenant Governor Husted and uh, uh, other state dignitaries in the rotunda on May, uh, it was uh, March 5th, uh, 2020. uh, And I gave a little you know, cut the virtual ribbon on the uh, on the range, and the only time I used the word or talking about uh, you know a virus, uh, I was talking about a malware packet. You know, and two weeks later, right, we're shut down. Yeah. Uh, state government shut down, um, and so we've been able to build out the range capacity. And as of today, uh, Tom, we uh, have had thirteen thousand. Uh, Ohioans really? uh, a- access the range at some level of programming from very That's everything from K through 12 to adult continuing education, right? Correct. Correct. That's and, awesome. um, and, uh, and workforce, uh, direct workforce development. So we have run now 11 boot camps for underemployed, unemployed, or people who want to sh- switch careers. Uh, that are industry uh, recognized credentials. So you can come in and train on the range. If you, uh, uh, for a number of these boot camps, we've been able to raise uh, funding from some sponsors and some grants that we had at UC and we'll pay for the voucher. So if you pass the boot camp, because the the taking the certification test a couple hundred bucks, uh, you know, for some people, um, so we're, we're trying to do our best and trying to help, uh, defray those costs, uh, for folks. But, um, uh, we've had 200 and don't quote me on the numbers, about 270 or so people, uh, go through these boot camps and, um, be prepared for industry, uh, credentialing. These are, you know, these are things that the, the range, uh, so I encourage, uh, your, your listeners to, to come and, um, take a look at all the programming that we're allowed to, uh, that we, that we are offering. The other interesting thing we did, Tom, is that we've got talent across the state, but it's spread out, right? And it's, right. it's not, yeah. not concentrated. So we have opened up uh, 16 regional programming centers really? across the state. So we're in every corner of Ohio. Um, we've held programming in 45 of our 88 counties. Um, wow. and this is again, all in this, uh, you know, two year period of the pandemic. Um, but with those regional programming centers, what it means is that a local business or a local, uh, school has somebody nearby who understands right. them at that level and, and, uh, can, um, support them locally. And then centrally, uh, through, uh, OCRI here at UC, uh, we can coordinate those uh, those local. So we're trying to get both ends of this, you know, play to local strength uh, while uh, taking advantage of the uh, the efficiencies of networking across the state. What I love about that is, well, a couple, of, I mean, many things. One is, first of all, you know, again, at Five or Future, we're looking at, you know, a dozen or more states, you know, in Flyover country, and Ohio is killing it. 
I mean, I don't really know what the dynamics were, but but the amount of of money, and then not just money, but you know, government follow through about um, you know trying to improve and fund the innovation economies across everything from universe. It's just an, really impressive, yeah. and what's great is you see it working. Right. Every day we're like, yeah, we did this in part because of money from the state. And but these private public partnerships seem to work really well. It's just for people from other states listening, I think that um, what Ohio is doing from our perspective and, you know, we're in Kentucky, so it's I'm not yeah. you know, pitching anybody is has been super impressive. And the other thing is and back to the range, I'm very big on this idea of the talent stack and how just education in general from K through 12, all the way up through PhD programs are going to really get transformed. And our idea of what education is, which is, it's not this end point, you know, I graduated in this year and now I know everything I need to know. Um, those days are over and yeah. Moving forward, people are going to say, I need to add this to my skill stack, right? If I'm a, right now, if I'm a, of a certain generation and I'm a tech leader, the stuff I need to add is soft skills, right? Yeah. I need to learn presentation skills and I need to learn how to talk about business instead of technology and those things. Um, but if I'm a CMO, I mean, I need to learn a little bit about, you know, sales automation. So, yeah. This idea of saying to someone, here's here's a certificate you can get that says you know how to do this thing, right? And you'll be adding certificates throughout your lifetime right. is the future. I mean, I, yeah. I just don't see how it can't be. Yeah, no, I, I think that's uh, I think you nailed it uh, with that, Tom. And, and, you know, this, again, sort of at that broader macro level, it, it's all sort of falls under a, a fairly coherent conceptualization, right, of cyberspace, from the security standpoint, if I'm telling you that we have to persist in a fluid technological environment, right? right. Well, the only way you, if, if you passed the test uh, two years ago, right, right, and that was your world, um, then you're in big trouble, right? If you right. haven't, you haven't continually uh, uh, stayed in a in, in this fluid modality does that mean that you have to be training all the time no right but we have to get out of uh the modality and what we're trying to offer uh, tom through the ocri is to get us beyond uh uh thinking about cybersecurity in particular digital interface in general through a compliance check the box model right so what, my goal in life, uh, Tom, right now is I, I want to get rid of uh, cy October as Cybersecurity Month. Yeah, right, right. right. Every if, morning is Cybersecurity Month. If I'm successful, there will not be a month because it needs to be a year. It needs to be a decade. It needs to be a millennia right. Right, yeah. uh, of this. This is what we've created, right? The, the, the 21st century is global and interconnected through this technical, uh, just remarkable space. And we're doing so many good things through it. And I like to say that we have to ensure, so those of us that work on strategy and policy in particular, uh, have to combine with our technical colleagues to make sure that the vitality that's streaming through cyberspace, that's pulsating through cyberspace, doesn't get overwhelmed by its vulnerability, right? Wow, because that's a this, really I, elegant way to say it. Because they coexist, that's the challenge, right? The vitality and the vulnerability coexist. And our job is just make sure that that vitality continually wins out, right, over uh, that vulnerability. And that re requires a different mindset and a different skill set. Right. And what we're trying to do through the Ohio Cyber Range Institute is uh, we like to say, uh, you know, that we're um, we're unlocking potential and securing the future, right? And so the unlocking of potential is 
both of those things on the skill sure. and on individual on the and within the internet itself. Well, my goal in life is to be as productive as you are. Jeez, but you know, I think that your career is such an interesting model for how things are going to have to evolve in the future, which is this multidisciplinary um, mashup of political science and in some cases ethics and technology and behavioral psychology and, you know, all these things that impact us into some coherent set of policies and rules um, and then providing the backup for people that, don't have the technical skills and saying, well, here's what you need to know to be able to follow these policies and rules. I mean, I think it's just great. Yeah, no, I appreciate that endorsement in the sense that um, uh, that mashup, right, it's got a lot of components. And I've just been blessed that to just be surrounded by a lot of good people who are willing to uh, take some of these crazy or what would, would have, have appeared to be some crazy ideas um and uh, and work through them and uh you know when you have the when you look at our our structure organizationally and we have a co the co-directors are a political science a computer science pissed and an information technologist right that's it yeah that's and we're both and we're running our schools right we each one are directors of our own disciplines um but we're spending more time with each other than with our faculty. And it's because uh, what you've put your finger on, Tom, that, that is, that's the model, right, uh, for the future, that um, you, you, we have to take this disciplinary act expertise. Everybody kind of forgets when you say interdisciplinary, it anchors on disciplinary. So we all have value. Yeah, you got to have right? that part, right? You got to know how to. You don't have that expertise. Play an instrument, right. But how do we, you know, how do we uh, make that, um, that symphony, you know, to play your metaphor there, uh, you know, sound as good as it, it can be? It's not easy. Uh, no, you know, it's we're, not. We're not structured that way. Um, and, um, it takes, it, it's been taking a lot of effort. And so I think, you know, we've, uh, we've hit on, uh, the, the, the model, uh, that I think, uh, is generating, uh, some preliminary, uh, real successes. And, uh, over the next few years, we're really, really quite excited. And, uh, I'll, I'll sort of sum up that aspect of it, that, um, that public, um, uh, impact that I was talking about, you know, uh, that we want to make, um, it's, it's gotta be a two way street and, and we're setting this up to be a two way street. And, uh, we're really looking for, uh, private sector, uh, input. We can't teach this, this, this field out of textbooks. No, right? no. Uh, they're done before they even hit the, yeah, uh, right. by the time the textbooks are written, it's out of date. Yeah. Now, I still think my book's going to have some, you know, uh, it will have some <laughs> life, uh, because it, it tries to explain the, you know, the whole big kit and caboodle. The but, construct, uh, right. but the, uh, for us to, to continually uh, uh, make this curriculum vibrant enough and salient enough to, so that the workforce that we're producing is the workforce that's needed. Right. Right. So, that's right now, cute. I can tell you, you know, if if the strategy that we are advocating is right, we don't have the people to implement. Yeah. Right. So uh, this is I, I think we now have the right uh, strategic framework. Uh, I, I think cyber persistence is the right model uh, of framing all of these challenges. But now we have to start to educate that workforce to align with the skills and mindset that are needed and, in order yep. to achieve that. And, um, and that's the state of Ohio has done a, a terrific job in positioning us uh, with, uh, with the OCRI and then the university enabling uh, us to create these two research centers uh, uh, that are now going to get housed in this uh, innovation district. Um, uh, so, 
I'm hoping that you and I are talking in a few years and, uh, you know, we are in a much more uh, secure space, uh, a much more uh, just uh, vibrant uh, space. And that vitality side of the equation is completely uh, winning out over the vulnerability uh, side of the equation. Yeah, well, that would be great. And I, I hope we get to talk uh, before then. I think that, um, you know, you've left so many lessons for our listeners and our readers. And one of the themes that continually comes up, and it at first it really surprised me, but I think it's a lot of it is at the essence of what you're talking about, which is when we talk about Inter- interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary approaches to problems. In many cases, the first step is go have a conversation, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Just yeah. go have a cup of coffee, talk about, you know, the U S open or, you know, the PGA or whatever the tournament was, it was just, you know, but just start the conversation yeah. and get out of your silo. I mean, this is kind of America in general, right? And just, start talking to people that are approaching a problem with their discipline, right? And their expertise and make one plus one equal three instead of one plus one equals zero. Right. And it starts with just talking and yeah, building no, and, relationships. Right. And that's the other, the other aspect, right? Cause that, that talking then uh, enables uh, that relationship uh, building right. to a part. And we, you know, we don't have to agree on everything, uh, you no, know, I, no. I, I, you know, and that's part of the, you that's know, that's kind of the we, point of universities, right? right? We don't, that's, you know, let's, that's what let's we're, hash it out. Yeah, that's what we're, we're, we're kind of good at, um, right? Trying to bring that at, at a pretty, pretty, you know, good value, but, um, but yeah, you know, it, it needs to, uh, to, to, to create that openness. Um, you know, we were. Uh, we just had uh, I, my uh, colleagues that are in this sensing lab, uh, for example, the Institute for um, Remote Sensing, um, had me over for a talk. A little, it was a evening roundtable kind of thing, uh, uh, more of a salon feel to yeah, it. Right, uh, right. Some, some beverages going around uh, sure. uh, to to help, and um, you know, and and this was all we were talking about, just uh, where. Uh, uh, the ethical standards have to sit with uh, these algorithms that we are developing that are going to be capable of uh, of uh, independent decision making. What I call right. algorithmic agency. I, I'm oh, I'm that's a good term. We're, we're we're way past algorithmic or uh, artificial intelligence. Um, <laughs> we have to understand this uh, as um, as agency. Right as uh, decision making uh, capacity, and are we going to? Um, uh, how are we going to relate uh, to those? Uh, you know, to those um, uh, to those agents, and, and we haven't set up the uh, the organizational uh, legal uh, mechanisms for that just yet. We haven't gotten the societal norms. Uh, no, you know, no. For that. Um, and the implications, but that's both the uh, the daunting aspect of this, uh, Tom, uh, as well as I would argue the exciting part. You know, I've, I've been here 31 years at uh, the University of Cincinnati, and and I can honestly tell you that I feel like I'm just getting going uh, because <laughs> the the where we're going to face what the the changes. Um, the step function that's going to occur through uh, more pervasive algorithmic um, decision-making modeling, um, boy, we've got a lot, a lot of work. And and my concern is that we're not out in front of that. That we're yeah, kind of we're not. Reacting, you know, we're reacting to what gets thrown into the market, and then we figure it out later. That's not a really good. Uh, I'm a strategist, so. To me, that's that's the, the antithesis to, to strategic uh, intent. Well, and um, the technology is so far ahead of our ethical thinking, right? Um, I, we had a 
a, a distant relative who had been in the CIA since the OSS. And they were having a cocktail party. And back in the day, you know, the adults had their cocktail parties and the kids just hung out on the side. Right? Right. And so I ran up and I got kind of elected by the other, you know, 10 year old boys. Um, and to go up and ask him if the stuff in the CIA, and, and we weren't even supposed to know he was in the CIA, um, was as cool as James Bond. <laughs> and he, He's got a gin and tonic in his hands and he looks down and he goes, oh, much cooler, right? <laughs> and, and, I, and I've always remembered that because it's like, we don't really even understand where the technology is, yeah. right? And when you start to think about that, you realize we are going to have some very interesting questions to have to deal with because of this algorithmic agency which i love that term i'm going to start using it a lot because it makes me yeah. sound smart just, just, just like just cite me on that one because that's that's I that's will. my that, that that's uh i haven't heard anybody use that and, and, and that's the modeling that we're doing um that i'm going to be uh in our new in the center for cyber strategy and policy uh in this upcoming year uh, we're going to be launching a research project uh based on that construct right on um well, you know, when we uh, agreed to talk, I had no idea you had a book that was coming out. So what's the name of the book again? Yeah, so it's uh, Cyber Persistence Theory, Redefining National Security in Cyberspace. And now, do I have to be as smart as you to read it, or can a regular layperson read it? <laughs> it's, um, it's published by the uh, Oxford University Press's uh, what they call Bridging the Gap series. So it is a uh, book that's written from an academic perspective to talk to the policy community. Okay. So right. there's uh, uh, different weights to the different chapters, uh, whether it's sure. uh, on one side of the bridge or the other, uh, but, um, but it is intentionally trying to bridge the gap between uh, thinking big about the fundamentals in this space, but then just not leaving you there as a reader, but saying, here's the practical Consequences. We look at several different countries, from uh, from China uh, to the United States, uh, and how they are managing this space, uh, and then some of the shifts uh, that we think uh, have to occur, uh, both for for business and government, if they're going to be um, securing themselves uh, in this uh, in this new uh, environment. Well, it's definitely timely. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much, man. This has been great. I've really enjoyed it. And, yeah, no, I uh, did I, too. I appreciate uh, you taking the time, and uh, I hope we get to talk soon again.